gambling, speculating, saving, and investing. What's the difference? So what we're going to talk about today is these four, what, what's the definition of them? How do you know which one you're doing? So we're going to talk about the difference between the four of them. I'm going to talk about a few things I don't normally talk about, but you know, um, meme stocks, NFTs, and cryptocurrencies, if you haven't heard of them, I'm going to just tell you a bit about what they are. And then we're going to go through all these different uh, possible ways of using your money and fit them into those four categories. So meme stocks, NFTs, cryptocurrencies, lotteries, futures, options, rental properties, bonds, GICs, dividend stocks, equities. Which of those four categories do they fit in? Are they gambling, speculating, saving, or investing? I'm going to put you, I'm going to show you my view on which category that each one of them is in. Um, we're going to talk about how high do long-term returns have to be to for something to be considered an investment. Uh, we're going to under, talk about how the stock market can actually be all four. The stock market can be gam gambling, speculating, saving, or investing, depending on how you do it. And then we're going to talk about how to be confident you are investing effectively. So first I can tell you my definition. So gambling is when the odds are against you. Okay. So odds are just against you. And the more you do it, the, it's, it's not going to work. So um, the um, usually what happens is you give a, a, a small chance of a really big gain, but odds are against you. Okay, so at any time, anytime odds are against you long term, we call that gambling. Now, speculating is when it's 50 50, could go one way or the other. You're just speculating on it. Okay, now saving, saving is when you're putting your money in and you expect it to grow over time. You've got something that's expected to go over time, but uh, it's not enough to provide for your life goals. So remember, I'm a fee-for-service financial planner. I help you and people achieve your life goals. So to me, saving is when you're putting some money and it's growing, but it's not gonna be enough for your goals. So it's mostly there just to kind of uh, not lose the money um, you want to make it's not more than it's not just keeping up with your buying power with inflation. It's more than that. You're actually trying to, to grow, but but not enough to achieve your life goal. Now, in in my opinion, from doing you know over a thousand financial plans, that would be anything with let's say a five or six percent long term rate of return or less, is what I would call. Um, uh, saving. So that's inflation plus two or 3%, that kind of thing. And the reason, just from experience, if that's what you're making, it's just not going to be enough for you for long term. And I am going to show you that later on. And then lastly, investing. So investing are odds are in your favor and the expected long term return is high enough for your long term goals. So now it's seven or eight percent or more. Uh, and that's what you need. And I'll show you again uh, why why it is that you need that number. Th these uh, percentages are, are a bit arbitrary, but I kind of draw the line just from doing it with so many financial plans of what actually works. Okay, let's so talk about the first one, gambling. So gambling, the odds are against you. So a few examples, uh, casinos obviously are uh, odds are against you. The uh, It's the house is the house. Uh, it, it's set up so the house wins long, long term. So I consider that to be entertainment. So I personally, I have no interest in a, in a casino. Uh, find it kind of boring, but um, I see why people would want to go there. And you get this, you know, out, outside chance of a of a big win. Usually, it's people with not a lot of money because the that they actually value getting a getting a chunk of money. But I think of it as entertainment. Oh, you know, like I like to go for dinner and go sports games and theater and that kind of thing. So I'm spending money on things that are entertaining. Uh, that are entertainment. And if, and if you uh, go to the casino and spend some money and it's the amount of money that you can afford to spend on entertainment and that's what you choose to do, then that's fine. So another one is the lottery. So again, the lottery, you have a really small chance of a very big payoff. You know, it might, might be a little bit fun. Now, if you've been a client for a, for a while or you know me, you've probably heard my speech on the lottery. So it's, you know, Odds are odds are against you. We call it, it's, you know, some people call it a tax on the stupid. So, um, you know, because you're almost definitely not going to not going to win. And actually, interestingly, is I've, I've known people that have, you know, bought lottery tickets every single week for 40 years. And, you know, if they took the amount of money that they um, that they use for lottery tickets and just invested in the stock market over that time, they would have a million dollars. So you, you've actually invested a million bucks 
on a chance to win a million and you and almost nobody wins it so so anyway lotteries I, I i love i love to criticize them and make fun of them but uh bottom line again if to me lottery fits into the entertainment category you just buy something if you find it fun and you can talk with your friends and your partner about what will you do if you win but but th these aren't these aren't investments in any way they're just they're just uh, gambling so now let's talk about some of these other trendy things so meme stocks so these are actually companies stocks that get that got really popular and this is something that just happened in the last few years uh the first one was a company called gamestop which was a you know a computer game store that uh that you know i like i like going to the game store but you know wasn't doing it wasn't really doing what well, wasn't making any money and um uh, what it is, it's a little bit of the David versus Goliath thing. So um, a bunch of investors somehow thought that the price of these stocks were super low because there were some big guys, hedge funds that were shorting it. So shorting it means they're selling it. They're borrowing uh, the shares and selling it just to just to force the price down um, so that they can make money uh, uh, if it, you know, if, if it, really goes down and they can buy back at a lower price. So basically they're artificially pushing the price down. Now, the funny thing is from being involved in the hedge fund industry, I can tell you the guys that short are not the big guys. They're the little guys. These are the small kind of crazy people that that uh, always think they know better and short the market. So the guys shorting aren't, aren't the big guys. So, but anyway, that's, that's kind of what was, uh, that was kind of what was behind all of this. So um, and now it, it really got popular during uh, during the lockdowns and, you know, a bunch of board board people. And then uh, there was one app called uh, Robinhood, a trading place where you could trade with no fees and you get people just uh, buying up on it. And then they go on social media and someone would, would pick a stock that everyone should pile into and try to try to attack these uh, supposedly short investors um however you know it's the ones that are shorting it however you know it's really mostly the, the companies aren't aren't making money and that's why they're so cheap so gamestop for example was the first one it was around one a buck 50 a share something like that and a whole bunch of people just got into buying and they bid it all the way up to 87 dollars a share so now now it's down to about 26 dollars a share and the company is still losing money it's been losing money all this time so it's it's you know it's you know you wonder how how is it actually worth anything? It's probably still only worth one or two bucks a share. It's probably eventually going to go down there. So this is uh, this is why I call it uh, <clears throat> call it gambling. It's because the prices just are way above what it's actually worth, and you have to ex expect that long term it's eventually going to go way down again, probably close to where it, <laughs> where it originally started. So you're probably going to lose money on it. So now the funny thing about it is the people involved in it do have a sense of humor and actually maybe a, a sense of perspective because they the term that they call themselves these are the collective group of people that buy these stocks we call them apes right because they're all kind of aping each other and any profits if they do make a profit on it um they call them tendies which is short for chicken tenders basically the profits last as long as you know uh, your your chicken tenders last but but so it's not really something uh, you know that, that you do long term so that's me. That's what a meme stock is. It's just meme is just got to be a popular name, and it just got bid up. So now NFTs are the, the term is non fungible tokens. Really, what it is it's a computer image. Uh, non fungible means you can't copy it. So uh, when you th think of it, just think of it like a, a computer image or a short video or something, something you can't copy, and you buy it, uh, and you buy it for that reason. So and it came out of the cryptocurrency world, you know. If you're buying, you know, coins that are just uh, just on the internet, maybe you also buy images. You buy assets that are on the internet and not real assets. So the first NFT was uh, was came out in 2014. It was some digital artist. It was called Quantum. It was a short video of the artist's wife, and then at the end, it managed to sell it. And you know, most things like that don't really sell, but occasionally you get some that, that really sell. And then about 2017 or 2018, it got into uh, the big thing that got it big was was a, a video game called uh, a computer game called uh, Crypto Kitties. Um, and basically what happens is you're, um, it's, um, you know, you're buying something within the app. So basically you're buying assets inside a video game. 
you're, you're buying something, clothes and weapons and things like that. So now lately, we, the metaverse is starting to come up. You know, Facebook is trying to create this metaverse. So it's kind of a place to live on the computer instead of real life. And um, and now what they're doing is they're selling, you can buy land, quote unquote, land, a piece of some place that's on the metaverse again. So now to me is none of these are actually, uh, obviously this is just gambling. Who knows? Like you don't really own anything in any of these cases. So if someone turns the computer off, you own, you own nothing. So, you know, instead of having a painting by a, by a famous painter you have a picture of the painting that's on your computer you know so what's that what is that actually worth so to me that's what i call the greater fool theory you know what that's what you're betting on you paid a thousand bucks for it you were a fool the what you're betting on is some greater fool is going to pay you two thousand for it someday so but you know there's no intrinsic value there's no way you can measure what this thing is worth they're not real so uh to me is you you pretty well have to assume you're probably going to lose all your money or most of it in that. So clearly gambling. So let's start with cryptocurrencies. So uh, cryptocurrency are, um, so they're, they're uh, kind of a, a way to buy, uh, it's it's intended to be a type of money that that, that you can get and, and buy an exchange uh, with. Uh, and the idea originally was to avoid the big banks and avoid the governments and the fiat currency, quote unquote, which are the real dollars backed by fiat, meaning law, um, backed by law and also backed by governments and, the, and taxation. Uh, that's what backs real currencies. But these are meant to be separate, you know, things that are on the Internet, the governments and, and the big guys can't get at and uh, that you could freely move around. So it's kind of an interesting idea. But um but where is that actually going to go? So it started off with Bitcoin, and now it's really mushroomed. So, so that it's, uh, you know, there's many, all kinds of them available now. Um, there was an initial, initial bubble back in 2018, and then it subsided for a few years. And then during the lockdowns in 2021, it had a bigger bubble. And now, you know, the last year, it's down 75%. Um, and as a reasonable number of them have, have disappeared completely. So... Um, now, uh, Bitcoin is actually, um, it's it's tracked on something called a blockchain, which is a, it's a, essentially a, a form of accounting. Is an accountant, like I could say, it's a type of accounting where you're accounting for all these, uh, all who's got this money. But it's kind of, it's, it's, it's funny, it's meant to be um, uh, completely confidential. However, what actually happens is all the accounts are available to everybody, but nobody knows who anything is. And because everybody's tracking it, you don't need a big bank or anything like that to track it. So, you know, it's a, it's an interesting concept. Um, now, what's actually happened to them is, you know, they were intended to be currencies, but ha what happened is they just became forms of speculation. So the price is fluctuating so much that they're not useful as a currency. So, for example, would you sell your house for 10 current for 10 bitcoin you know like you don't know what the value is you wouldn't sell for that you don't know it just fluctuates too much in value to be any use as a currency so it it just became this big speculation thing and people were buying it just because it's going up and now that it's going down the question is is going to collapse completely so what it kind of reminds me of uh, is a few hundred years ago there was a big bubble in tulips so it started off in holland that um Tulips were seen as having a, va a value, value, and you could get these rare tulips that that were that you could breed and were, were, were worth a lot, and and they became almost the type of currency. People started just bidding up huge amounts for them, and it got crazy how much they were bidding. And of course, it just collapsed because there was really nothing there. So, to me, is is cryptocurrencies could be like that too. Now there are some reasons to keep them around. So um, so. Th it's quite likely that they won't disappear completely. So um, now, honestly, you know what? The real the real uses that are established for them are for organized crime and for tax evasion. So that's, you know, kind of out there reasons that they're actually used, which are not such good reasons. So, um, <clears throat> but they, they, they may actually be useful for other things. So one of the big problems is that we have um, uh, you know, for example, between U.S. and Canada, it's still hard to move money between. It's not just you can't just freely move money between it, between them. You know, to cash a check, uh, 
from the from a U.S. person. It still take weeks to cash the check, and they they haven't integrated uh, integrated these things. So, and you know, there's lots of global trade happening, and so to be able to move money back and forth between uh, between countries, that's maybe the big opportunity for them is is to as a way to just move money around. That that the currencies are there's so many rules around around trade and restrictions between company countries that that may be actually why they actually stay stay around so now when you talk to people who believe in these um you know i often say they're you know who knows just it's just gambling you don't know where they're going to go and they're going to say well and they give you the argument about why they should exist and okay so let's say maybe they exist but what are they worth again there isn't any intrinsic intrinsic value they start out a dollar and then they went up to 87 bitcoin went up to 87 dollars and now 87 thousand and now it's at 26 thousand so what's it worth is it worth one dollar or 26 thousand or 87 thousand and there's no way to calculate it which means you know it, it um it, it's not really something that you can bet on so it, maybe it survives but it only is worth a buck you know, which means it's your, your any money that's in it is almost completely gone. So, so that's why I put it in the gambling uh, category. Now, um, I, re I used to think I used to put it in the speculating, thinking the odds are 50 50. We don't know what it's worth. Uh, it could go up, could go down. No way of knowing. So let's put it in that in, in that category. The problem with it is there are now 21,000 different cryptocurrencies. And, you know, obviously most of them can never survive. So you, there's no there's no way that we have a need for 21,000. And, and almost all of them are probably going to survive. And as a parallel, what I see as a possible parallel, um, let's say we go back to the 1920s. The big thing then was cars. People were really getting into cars. And there were, there were uh, a couple hundred auto uh, uh, companies at the time. Now, by all measures, cars have been spectacularly successful the last 100 years. And yet we have, you know, five or six manufacturers that have pretty well all of it. And I think that's going to happen with cryptocurrencies. We're not going to have 21,000. Eventually, we might have five or 10 or one or something. So almost all of them are going to survive, are going to disappear. And they aren't redesigned for merging. So there is only one way to disappear, and that's disappearing. So I don't know. We're going to see what happens with all of them, but um, so this is why I put them in the in the, uh, in the gambling category. But because to me, is the vast majority of them are probably going to go to zero and disappear eventually, and maybe and maybe a few will survive. Now, one of the advantages of of it, the, the other advantages is that the real money is backed by governments that tend to print money and just and, and and they create inflation so the value of real dollars goes down while cryptocurrencies they it's a they have a formula to measurably restrict how fast it's being uh, the new money is being printed so you don't get this ma major kind of inflation so i mean there are we have these spendthrift governments now that are just spending tons and tons of money so and running up their debts and you don't have that issue you know, uh, with cryptocurrencies. So again, some reasons why they might exist long term, but it's really hard to see where they are. Now, there are some things called stable coins where they're where they're linking it to the U.S. dollar, and again, that's maybe where the answer is: is to have a stable coin that's linked, and then you can move money around freely, and where you don't get inflation, and it becomes a global currency. That is something that may actually be worthwhile. So far, these stable coins have had trouble um, because they don't have an effective way to back them. And uh, they try to, to link them, but then it collapses when, when too many people buy it. So interesting to see what happens. Bottom line is I still put cryptocurrencies in the gambling bucket, and we'll see what happens with them down the road. Uh, another thing that's in gambling is actually some stock market investing, and that's when you get into something that's really trendy or a bubble, bubble stocks. So something where there aren't fundamentals to support it, companies aren't making that much money and aren't expected to. So a big example, a few years ago, we had pot stocks. Everybody was piling out of them. It was really obvious to anybody looking at it, this was going to fall 80% because they were, they ran up the huge amount. They weren't huge amount. They weren't, there was no intrinsic value anywhere close to it. And, uh, you know, they were going to run into competition and regulation and um, competition with the illegal market and and uh, all, all the, with each other and uh, 
all this, the issues to do with manufacturing. And so, you know, it was going to be the profits weren't going to be anywhere close to what, what some people were projecting. And so they're going to collapse. So, and then, you know, for example, the 1990s, we had the, the dot com stocks. Again, all these things came out with no profits and often no sales. So how could it be worth that kind of money? We had a bubble in income trusts in uh, around 2005. So, so the, if you're if you're buying something that's that you're buying because it's a hot trend and it's super expensive and not worth anywhere close to that, that's that's just uh, that's just gambling because it's probably going to go back down. Okay. So those are the things I I could I put in the gambling category. Uh, now let's talk about speculating. So speculating is things that are 50 50 could could go your one way could might not it's like the toss of a coin that would be speculating okay now also with speculating is if you take a, a one area that's happening and all, everybody together half the people win half the people lose that's kind of the definition of of speculating a simple one is is uh betting with with uh, just betting with a friend you know sports betting so sports betting online Again, it's a casino effect. The formulas are against you, and you're and the house is, is you know wins over time. Odds are are a little bit against you, but if you're just betting against a friend, 50-50, your odds are 50-50. Okay, another one is um, in the investing area is futures and options. Now, options are mostly um, you know ninety days. Um, uh, they're an option to buy or to sell a stock at a certain price in 90 days. So that's what options uh, options are. And um, so again, if you buy it, then somebody else is selling it. If it goes up or whatever, and you make some money, the other person uh, lost exactly the same amount of money or would have made it if they hadn't had this option. So again, so options, the uh, not counting costs, the grand total that everybody makes together is zero. Okay, so if you made a thousand and one dollars, somebody else lost a thousand and one dollars. Now, if you're very skilled, you can do okay this way, and it's and there are some some strategies that that in, involve that. So it it can be something to do, uh, you know, as, as an investment in some specific cases, but essentially, but basically. The options themselves are a 50-50 speculation. So where they're sometimes used in the most value is most options end up being not quite making the price because it's usually based on a price higher than today. And most of the time they don't make it. And they and they and then if so if they're not at that price on the due date, they're worth nothing. So the the people that sold it actually, you know, get to save, get to save all their money. So, um, and so some companies use it to where they own shares and they just sell options against it. So, and then what they're doing is they're they're taking the the amount that they get for the, it's called the premium, the amount that they get for selling the option, and they're just keeping that kind of as income. Okay. So now again, what's happening with something like that is with every option strategy, you get something and you lose something. So in that case, what happens if you're selling against them, you get some income, but you lose the chance of a big growth. Considering stocks sometimes have, you know, short-term large gains, you're giving that up. And so most of the time, people that do that, of course, make less money than people who don't sell against them. They make steady money instead of making higher, you know, long-term rate of return. So now futures are similar. They tend to be longer, six months, a year, two years, and they're usually... Um, on you know crops like if they started out with a lot of grains for farmers trying to get to lock in the price that they would sell in sell their harvest so and uh futures are often on on a currency the what's the us dollar going to be in in six months or a year so that's what futures are again it's a 50 50 thing and um so we just we just call it it kind of speculating, and you know there are some smart people that think they know what they're doing, and maybe they do, and but the thing about it is, the, the futures and options on their own aren't going to make you money. Uh, you can only do well by having skill and constantly having skill as well as some luck, I guess. So that's the only way you can make money with them long term. So that's why we just call it speculating. All right, so a couple other other options are day trading stocks and also the short term stock market. So let me just show you how that works. All right, so this these are the odds of making money in the stock market based on history. 
Okay. And notice here, that if you look at it over different time periods, so uh, these are the months, quarters, and years. And so um, if you're looking at daily returns, 53% of days are up, 47% are down. So basically, it's basically 50-50. If you're in and out in a day or less, it's basically 50-50 whether you're up. Now, if you're at a month, you're up to 75%. But see, once you're up to 20, 25 years, it's always been positive. Okay, so that's the difference. This is certainly investing. Your money, you, you have a good chance of making a good rate of, rate of return long term. But short terms, day trading and short term investing like this is is uh, is in the uh, speculation group because it's basically a 50 50 thing. So, you know, I'll show you also this is so this is one year rate of returns and just shows you. So this is 150 years of it. And no, so here what happens is three quarters of, of the years are up, but a quarter of them are down. So one year is still fairly risky to do as an investment, but same data with the 25 year periods, so it's always been up. In fact, it's always had a good gain. And in fact, if you take the modern stock market starting, you know, the 1930s, so ending in the, in the mid fifties till now, the worst 25 year um, gain was a, was a return of 7.9, like 8% a year. It was the worst 25 year return. So, you know, it provides a long-term return reliably over the long-term, but short-term it doesn't. So, so, that, so those are also fitting into the, uh, short, that's why short-term investing and day trading are in the speculation group. So now let's talk about saving. So saving is, you know, kind of the standard stuff, uh, savings accounts, GICs, um, bonds, um, that kind of thing. So you, those, of course, are saving. You're just getting some, you're getting some interest and ra rate of return, but it's not enough to, to achieve your goals. Now, to me is, I, I would also put balance funds and things like that in the same category, even uh, stock market investing, if it's for income. So dividend investing uh, might be, be, you're just buying good quality stocks, but if you're, if you're doing it for the dividend or for the income, then you're probably going to get uh, uh, quite a bit lower rate of return. You're probably going to only get five, six long percent long term, and it's too low to achieve your uh, your life goals. So, now another example here uh, of the saving category is is um, rental properties that are paid off, and this is actually an important uh, distinction to make. So, all right. So if you have a paid off mortgage. So you have a, let's say you have a million dollar property. It makes, I'm just, I'm making up some numbers based on things that I've seen, but just to give you a kind of a sense of it. Uh, let's say the rent is 3000 a month. So after your expenses, you know, uh, condo fees and uh, property taxes and repairs and utilities, that kind of thing. So let's say you're making 2000 a month. So that's 2,500, 25,000 a year. You're making two and a half percent on your million dollars. And then the growth of the of the property is three to four percent a year. So you're making you know five or six percent per year is kind of your profit on this on this rental property that's paid off. Not that great of a rate of return. It's too low for your goals. So to me, is I I put the rental properties with a paid off mortgage in the saving category. It's it's not really about about growing your money. It's just about. Uh, um, it's about uh, keeping your money and you know getting a little bit of return on it, and it's also very tax inefficient because all that rent is taxable. So it's like having a rental property with a paid-off mortgage is actually a lot like a GIC. You get a modest amount that's fully taxable, and uh, so uh, now if you have one with a big mortgage, it can be different though. So if you build a million dollar property, you see you have a seven hundred fifty thousand dollar mortgage. Now, what happens with most with if you have a big mortgage, most of the time the cash flow is a break even. Now, if you're smart, you can get it with a with a modest, um, positive cash flow, which is good. But let's assume for a minute that the break that the that it's a break even on the cash flow. However, you're making the property is growing by let's say three percent a year, so that's three percent of a million is thirty thousand. But see, remember you've only invested oh two hundred and fifty thousand, so you're making like twelve percent. Oh, I've got the wrong numbers on here. It's but anyway, you're making twelve or fifteen percent on your on your investment because um, you've only got two hundred thousand or two hundred and fifty thousand um, invested in this, and you're making thirty thousand art. So bottom line is so rental properties need a large mortgage to be a good investment. A paid off one is a lousy investment most of the time. 
uh, very property specific, but basically a, a poor investment. But when you have a big mortgage on it, it can be a decent investment. So I have a property um, rental property rule, and here's my rule: when a mortgage is uh, when your mortgage is down to half the value of the property, then you're better off selling it because you can take that half of the money, you can invest it in the, in the equities in the stock market, you can get a higher return, no work, less tax. So at that point, why would you keep the rental property? So you you got to, you know, the, the different methods. Sometimes we do things like uh, Smith Maneuver or Cash Dam just to keep the, 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 uh, the debt on the mortgage uh, on the rental property high in order to make it a, a, a better, better rate of return. Okay, so now, so that's the uh, the saving category. Sorry, that's the saving category. So the next thing, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the investing category. Okay, so remember, investing is the odds are in your favor, and you're making, a, you know, 7 or 8% enough or more, let's say a good enough rate of return to, to for the long-term growth. And so there it can be, of course, it could be your your paid off mortgage. And the, the main thing that fits into the investing category is the stock market. So you're investing in companies with large managements and they're growing their profits over time. And so I showed you the chart just back here where so the, the average, the, the lowest in modern stock market, the lowest 25 year return was 8% a year. So you're making this good rate of return as a long term. I mean, the average long term has been, you know, 10 or 11%, depending on which market, which period of time. But that's the kind of rate of return that you need. You need that's what you need to achieve your long term goals. So now let me show you why I say that this is what you need. I've had this in a few other talks. But this is so critical to understand because most of the investment industry is all about, you know, um, be reducing your risk and, you know, being a moderate risk and having 60, 40, like half, half stocks, half bonds kind of thing, lower, lower, um, lower fluctuation of your investment. The problem is that you just can't make your, your uh, retirement goal that way. So it's that, you know, this is the investment industry doing it. It's people who don't do financial planning and don't realize that, that, um, uh, that you are not going to achieve your goal this way. So these are, I'm just going to show you these a bunch of numbers here, but I just give, give the key ones. So here's examples. So I've done, you know, well over a thousand financial plans, comprehensive ones. And so this is an example of a modest one. It's a single person age 35, being 50,000 a year, want to retire on 40,000 a year, 80% 80, 80 of what they're making in 30 years. And we just, um, we counted all the government pensions and stuff. So if they're making 5%, a balanced portfolio, half stocks, half bonds, they have to invest 17000 a year. That's 34% of their income. But if they make 8% a year, if they have a bit of a risk tolerance and can be in, in the stock market long term, they only have to invest 6500 That's 13% of your income. That's way more reasonable. So here's the same thing with a couple, 50000 each. They make 100000 together. They want to retire on 80000 when they retire, 80,000 a year. Again, they have to invest 34% of their gross income. They make 100,000 before tax, they need to invest 34,000 of it. That's nuts. So however, as soon as, as soon as you invest in equities, make 8%, it's only 13%. 13, 13,000 from their, from their, um, from their 100,000 of income. Again, not easy, but that's certainly in the doable range to do that. So let's look at a more comfortable one. This is a single person earning 100,000, one retiring at 75,000. Again, they have to invest 50,000, 50% 50 of your income. So to, if you make 100,000 for 30 years, you're going to make 5% on your investment. You want to retire on 75,000. You have to invest 50,000 per year. Now that's 100,000. You only bring home about 75 and you have to invest 50 of it. That's just totally crazy. So now again, if your equity is 8%, it's 20% of your income, you know, in the reasonable range. Here's a married couple, 100,000 each. So they want to retire on 75,000 each. So 200,000 together, retire around 150,000. Um, at 5% rate of return, they need to invest 50% of their gross income, 100,000 a year. At 8% rate of return, they have to invest 40,000, 20% of their income. Again, this is doable. This is not. This is why I tell you. So if you're investing and you're getting a 5% rate of return, there's just really no chance that you can retire comfortably. And that's why I put them in the saving category. It's about not losing your money and making a modest return on it. But it's not about achieving your life goals. So uh, here's a real upscale one. Let's say you're making 500000 You want to retire on 300000 a year. 
again, you have to invest 265,000. So half of your income again, crazy. And it, But if you make 8%, then it's only 20, 21% of your income. So this is why it's so important to be able to, to be able to do this. So now let's go to after retirement. And so, you know, the thinking often is, well, I'm going to make invest effectively until I retire. But then, of course, you have to invest much more conservatively, right? Again, that is false. That's what people who don't do financial planning will tell you. So, but here's an example. So if you have, a, again, the modest, re, a modest retirement, so, you know, a couple making 50,000 each, 100,000 together, they want to retire on 40,000 each, that's 80,000 a year. Um, when you do the actual plan and look at where does the money come from, the money, so they retire at 65 and they live to 100. Okay, in that period of time, the money that they withdraw for those uh, 35 years, 8% of it was what they saved. 10% was growth before retirement. 82% was growth after retirement at 5%. Now, 8%, it's 88%. So, the, you know, 85% of your retirement income is growth after your retirement. And that's why you still need a good rate of return even after you retire. So remember these people, it looks like only 82 versus 88, but remember those people would never have got there. These people would have. So um, this is with a more comfortable one, 100,000, um, a couple hundred thousand each, so 200,000 together, retiring on 150, 75,000 each, 150,000. Um, they, they um, uh, out of their retirement, 35 year retirement income, uh, 70%, if they're making 5%, 70% is growth after retirement, 80% if you're uh, making 8% again. So again, 70 or 80 or 90% of your retirement income is growth after your retirement. So you have to stay invested effectively even after you retire. So now uh, what I want to show you is the stock market here can actually be any of these four. Okay, so as well as real estate. So here's a little summary of, of what, what I call gambling, what's speculating, what's saving and investing. So rental properties, I put them here beside by side. They could be saving and they could invest, be investing. The determining factor is how big the mortgage is. So to me is if the mortgage is half or more of the value of the property, I would put them in the investing category. If it's smaller, I put it in the saving category. St stock market investing can be any one of these four. So trendy bubble stocks is, gum, is gambling, buying something you know, like pot stocks a few years ago. Speculating if you're buying day trading or just really short-term equity, you're going to put money in for a, a day or a few days. That's just speculating. Uh, saving is you know income investing for the dividend or for the income. Again, you, you'd... Um, that's just kind of that's saving. It's not going to make you enough likely for your goals. And then long-term equity investment is is what we call investing. All right. So now, how do we how do, can we be confident in in equity investing though? So I'm investing in the stock market, and I know it grows long term. But how do I actually make sure that I get that rate of return and have a feeling of confidence in it? So I'm putting away money. I want to retire in a few decades, and I just want to have a confidence that I'm going to get there. You know, I'm putting away enough money based on a financial plan, but how do I know the investments are going to work? So, and the big thing is, you know, the broad indexes have done enough. And I'm talking broad, I'm talking about the global stock market index is the best. The U.S. is kind of half the world stock market. Those are kind of the two biggies. I wouldn't really count Canada in there because we're only two or three sectors, really. So, um, so we're not a we're not a proper the the, the TSX 60, the Canadian index, isn't a proper a proper portfolio. Um, however, you know, global U.S. Uh, broad indexes have reliably provided that kind of return long term, and would be at least would be expected to long term. Global have run into some problems when certain companies countries have had problems, but basically we do expect it to to do well long term. So, buying an index fund, a global or U.S. index fund, a broad index fund or, or ETF, you're probably going to get there to find doing it that way. So we work with a couple of portfolios. One is an index plus. So basically what we're trying to do is find a way to pay for ourselves and get you the full return or more of the index. So the index plus portfolio manager, he charges a fee basically based on how much he beats the index. So if he doesn't beat the index, then, you know, he's, he's very close to the index and you get roughly the index return, but, but, uh, He's pays himself. He's doing this because he expects to beat the index over time. He pays himself by taking 20% of the return above the index. Okay. So to me, that certainly beats index investing because there's a good chance 
of getting return above the index. And plus his fee also pays us, which means you get uh, ongoing financial planning um, advice and in, uh, in all areas of your finances. All right. Then we also have this all-star fund manager, portfolio manager. So he's trying to find the world's best investors. And here, you know, they, each one of them is a 15 to 30 year track record beating their major indexes like the US or global index after all fees, including ours. That's the track record they have. And we all believe their skill and we expect them to keep doing it over time. And so, you know, having when you're with when you're invested with a really elite portfolio manager like this with um, uh, all star fund managers, really top fund managers, that's when you can. I, I, that's what I find personally is I, is I find that's what really gives us and our clients confidence that you're going to achieve your goal long term because you know the index itself does fine over time but we know it occasionally gets into bubbles the index itself gets into bubbles and you know i remember the the uh in the late 1990s the uh the dot com dragged the entire index down a lot it got into a bubble and how do you know you're not getting into those when you've got these ex the experienced portfolio managers looking after your money not only do you expect to outperform the index over time but we actually have someone that we have give our Give, we have confidence that when market's going all haywire, that you know we have someone who's going to be able to look after it all for us. So that's how we that's how we stay confident. All right, so that's my talk for today. So in short, this is what I call gambling lottery, casino, cryptocurrencies, meme stocks, NFTs, and trendy bubble stocks. That's I put them in the category of gambling. Um, speculating to me is betting with a friend, futures, options, day trading, and short-term equities. These are speculating. Saving, bank accounts, GICs, bonds, paid off rental properties, balanced funds, and income dividend investing. I put them in the saving category. And then the investing category is basically rental properties with big mortgage and equities as a long-term investment. So, all right. So again, so these are the topics of, of, what, of what we've uh, learned today. Thanks a lot for, uh, for uh, listening. Again, my name is Ed Rempel. My blog is Unconventional Wisdom. Um, so my blog is number one in Canada for a full-service financial planner. I'm a fee-for-service financial planner, so my, my team and I um, focus on writing comprehensive financial plans for you and finding out what you need to do to achieve the goal that, that you want. My blog is, is edremple.com. If you go to contact, you can fill out a form and we can fill out a free 30-minute consultation. And again, we're not trying to sell anything to you. The consultation is just to find out, are we a fit to, to work together? What is it that you're looking for? We'll tell you what we do. We'll see if it, whether or not we're a fit of, of what we want to do. And um, also, so I have a YouTube channel and a blog. And I try to do a, a usually a video, but a video article every Thursday. If you subscribe to them, uh, to the blog and the YouTube channel. All that means is you will get my um, my new videos and, and articles sent directly to your email each week. We don't do any other marketing of any type. Thanks again for listening, and we'll talk to you next week.